a second for everyone to get in here and then we'll get started. This is lovely just to see so many people. We have uh, over 150 people registered for this uh, for this special presentation. So we're really delighted. There's so much interest in this topic. So uh, Katie, do you want to pin me for everyone? Yep, you should be. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Center of Addiction and Faith and to our monthly webinar and discussion. We're so grateful you're here today. Uh, this is a special topic, and we have a special guest this month in recognition of National Recovery Month. Our guest is Dawn Eden Goldstein, and she'll be talking about her book, Father Ed, The Story of Bill W.'s Spiritual Sponsor. If you want a discounted copy of the book, uh, please click on the link in the chat page, which will put in there right now, if I can chew gum and talk at the same time, <laughs> which I can't, so I'll do that first, and then I'll keep talking. So there's a promotion code there that allows you to get a 30% discount from Orbis Books. So if you want to get a copy of the book that's being discussed today, uh, follow that link and use the uh, discount code FRE23. There are a lot of you here today. We'd love to see where you're all from. Um, if you want to put in the chat page just your name and city or state you're from, we'd, uh, it's fun to see where everybody's gathered from today. My name is uh, Pastor Ed Treat, and I am the Executive Director of the Center of Addiction and Faith. And here at the Center, we are working to awaken faith communities to address the addiction crisis, because the crisis is growing, as you know, or hopefully you know that. We believe faith communities could play a huge role in solving the addiction crisis. Uh, by better addressing the problem, faith communities would not only save a lot of young lives, but we would reduce crime, reduce homelessness, reduce incarceration rates, so much more. Addiction is really tied to just about every social issue we face today. There's something about it that's very pervasive. We think churches should learn more and be better equipped. We'll start here today appropriately with a word of prayer, and, uh, and then we'll introduce our host for today. Let's pause for a moment of silence to consider those who suffer from addiction, and we'll follow that with a prayer and the serenity prayer. God, our world is in trouble on so many fronts. And one of the areas that we talk about today, God, we, we ask that you would help guide our conversation, guide our understanding, and guide our passions toward helping to uh, help those who suffer from addiction in whatever form it takes. We pray the church would awaken to this issue and take a stronger stance and play a bigger role in solving the issues that people face today as they struggle. We thank you for the 12 steps, uh, the gift given through Bill W. and those uh, who were helped by this fellowship. And we thank you for our guest today who will be talking about Bill's spiritual sponsor. We pray for a deeper understanding of how this issue is tied to spirituality and how spirituality can help bring healing, hope, and restoration. In all things, God, Grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Amen. Our host today for today's webinar is Keaton Douglas. Keaton is on the board of the Center of Addiction and Faith, as well as the executive director of the I Thirst Initiative. She works also to empower churches to be a resource for those suffering from addictions and their families. She is the author of her own book, The Road to Hope, Responding to the Crisis of Addiction. Uh, we have a link that I'm putting in the chat page right now uh, so that you can get a copy of her book. Heaton, thank you for hosting today, and thank you for bringing such an excellent topic for us to consider this month. Heaton? 
Thanks so much, Pastor Ed. I'm delighted to be with everybody today, excited to share the Center of Addiction and Faith with those of you who are newcomers, and particularly excited to welcome Dawn Eden Goldstein here, Dr. Dawn Eden Goldstein. A few words about Dawn before we begin. She is the author of several books, but notably The Thrill of the Chaste, and my piece I give you, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints. Her books have been printed in 10 different languages. They have been sold more than 60,000 copies of them all over the world, which I have to tell you is quite an outstanding number. Um, she is a journalist by her initial trade. And I love this about you, Dawn, that you started off as a rock and roll journalist. How cool is this? I mean, that's pretty darn exciting. She also uh, was on the editorial staff of the New York Post, as well as the Daily News, papers that are very, very popular, particularly here in the New York metro area where I am. In 2016, Dawn became the very first woman to earn her doctorate in sacred theology from the University of St. Mary of the Lake in Illinois. Uh, she has taught in universities and in seminaries here in the United States. She has taught in the UK. She has taught in India. Fascinating. Um, today, Dawn is living in Washington, D.C., and most recently in 2022, she earned her licentiate in canon law from the Catholic University of America. And we're delighted to welcome her today because... Um, she wrote a book that I think is a watershed book for those of us that uh, work in the industry of addiction and spirituality, uh, those of us who have a love for the 12-step program, those of us who are students of the 12-step program. She has written a magnificent book entitled Father Ed, The Story of Bill W.'s Spiritual Sponsor. There it is. And we are very proud and pleased to welcome you, Dawn. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for hosting me. You know, I, I remember uh, meeting you uh, at uh, a fundraiser at the Vatican Embassy. <laughs> That's right. It, it was such a, a, a joy uh, to speak with you and to learn about this wonderful organization that you have that brings together professionals talking about uh, addiction in light of faith. Uh, that's just the sort of group that Father Ed would be so happy for and proud of. Thank you, Don. And you know, when I was reading your book, and I love books about history, and I love books, and that's really where I tend to go. And I read yours, and it was so engaging to me right from the very beginning. And I learned a lot about Father Ed. And I think we all have heard of Father Ed, um, those of us in the that's that study and work with the program, of course. But I learned some things about him that I didn't know. I, I love the fact that I learned that he was called Puggy yes. as a young man, that he um, that he was probably far less likely to be found with a book and much more likely to be found on a, on a, on a football field or baseball field, as it were, that he really, truly enjoyed that. I found out that he was also like you, a journalist early in his life. And I also found out that he suffered from a debilitating form of arthritis, which really uh, gave him chronic pain throughout mm -hmm. his life. He was engaged with those who were suffering all throughout his life in AA and beyond. But Dawn, tell me, this, this character of Father Ed, this human being that was so generous of spirit, how come, why do you think that nobody else, prior to the writing of your outstanding biography, nobody had really dug deeply into the life of Father Ed? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I can tell you that uh, there there were several people who attempted to write a biography of Father Ed before I did, uh, but none of them completed uh, their their work. Now, now Glenn Chestnut, uh, who was uh, a great AA historian, did towards the very end of his life publish a book called Father. Ed Bill Wilson's sponsor, uh, but or I think it's thought called Father Ed Dowling, Bill Wilson's sponsor. But uh, at that point, uh, Glenn Chestnut was ill, and so he just wasn't able to go to the archives to uh, research 
Father Ed. So he just kind of wrote this book length reflection on Father Ed's life, which I, I do recommend to people who are in the fellowship because his great knowledge of AA history and spirituality helps put what was known at that time about Father Ed in perspective. Um, but I was the first person to, in the archives, going through the archives to really write a book of the whole of Father Ed's life and um, and also interviewing many people who, who, knew, who knew him, including his niece and nephew. As far as why no one else completed uh, a work of, of, this, uh, of this, this type, uh, I think it has to do with that, you know, people would go into this thinking, well, Father Ed's Bill Wilson spiritual sponsor. Uh, so, you know, this will be something like um, that book that exists, The Soul of Sponsorship, which is about 100 pages long, and it's an edited version of, of the correspondence, the letters between Bill and mm -hmm. Father Ed. But the thing is that as soon as you go into the archives, what you find is that Father Ed wasn't just Bill Wilson's spiritual sponsor. Uh, he also had this ministry to uh, married couples, the Cana Conference. He also was involved in Recovery Incorporated, now known as Recovery International, uh, which is a, is a, a self-help group uh, for people who have anxiety and other nervous wow. disorders. And he so valued that program that he actually took facility, facil sorry, facilitator training wow. uh, so that he could fil facilitate recovery meetings. And uh, but beyond that, Father Ed was also an expert in participatory democracy, particularly proportional representation, what's now known as ranked choice uh, voting. He was 100 years ahead of his time yes. in interest in, in that. And so uh, when you start to kind of put together all these things, it becomes such an enormous task. In the writing of Father Ed, I had to make a conscious decision. Well, many times over, uh, I had to decide what to include about Father Ed and what to, and 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 what to minimize. Yeah. I remember his nephew at one point, you know, said to me, "Well, you really don't have enough about the Cana Conference in here, his ministry to married couples, because it was such a huge part of his life, and it's not as big in terms of page length compared to his oh. other work with, you know." with AA uh, that's in the in the book. And I had to explain to his nephew, uh, and thankfully his niece understood, and I think his nephew came around because he eventually uh, endorsed uh, the, the book, but I had to explain like, yes, I know Kena was time-wise a huge part of Father Ed's life, but you know, it's a choice between like, do I have like a 400 page book with notes right. or become 500, 600 right. pages? Exactly. And then, you know, it, the the work of, of AA and his enormous impact on it has really affected the lives of millions. And while I'm sure yes, that the Cana yes. Conference has affected the lives of many, you know, AA has been worldwide. I mean, it's it's beyond really compare. And I know Pastor Ed had posed when we were when we were talking and 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 Ed jump in too, but both both Pastor Ed and I were wondering that, you know, Dawn, you have said that you are not in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You've not worked a 12-step program in terms of that uh that context. What brings a, a a rock and roll journalist that goes through all of this to to the subject matter of Father Ed? What piqued your interest that you decided I'm going to donate? I'm going to give the next five six years of my life to research of this this really amazing man. Uh, well, that's right. As you as you say, uh, I am not uh, a member of AA. I am what Father Ed would call underprivileged uh he he himself he called himself underprivileged as well because he also was not a member of aa he believed that the people who were in the fellowship were the truly privileged people because of this great spiritual fellowship uh that they that they had uh he admired the fellowship of aa so much uh, that he became a kind of honorary AA in the sense that there was an understanding that he could go to any AA meeting anywhere in the in the world uh, and you know even the closed meet meetings uh, so it, when he was traveling as he often did because of all the different topics that he was asked to to speak on including democracy uh, he would write to 
the AA uh, headquarters beforehand to ask where were the meetings where he was speaking, because this was during the 40s and right. the 50s, you know, long before it was easy to find where meetings are. Uh, and at one point he wrote to headquarters saying uh, with his typical humor, I have shamelessly been using AA as a lonely hearts club uh, because that that was where he found kindred spirits. He admired AA members honesty with themselves and 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 with and with god uh, he liked it that they in his words they said uh, they said the word the name god um you know openly and and not with a sort of you know fearfulness as though it were like saying the word legs in the victorian age right, right. <laughs> uh, so so yes i heard about father ed from an aa uh, member uh, and then i picked up that book the soul of sponsorship which is the uh thin edited uh volume of his correspondence with bill wilson that was 2008 and in that book you know the um the author and compiler robert fitzgerald sj he says Bill Wilson wanted to see a biography of Father Ed, and this is not that biography. So I thought, well, I really hope someone writes that biography. And then, you know, 11 years later, when no one else had written it, I thought, I, I guess it's, I guess it's up to me. Yeah. And I mean, it's, a, it's, it's just, it's wonderful. And I, I love the, the, the concept of the underprivileged. I too um, have thought that myself, that when I'm running a, a program or the, working with those that are in the program and they share with me the steps and I, I have subsequently worked the steps myself because I think they are so illuminating for all of us, all of us, and we should be working them. But I've also thought to myself, wow, how beautiful it is that so many people, right, have this program and a deep understanding of the moral principles of this program that they are using in every aspect of their lives that truly is a privilege they are they have been enlightened towards that and i know that you described so beautifully how um how father ed came to know about alcoholics anonymous and the 12 steps if i'm not mistaken through a couple by the name of grace and ed Leahy. that's correct yes and today and and also with the help of a of a, a very special nun by the, the name of sister mary alice rowan yes that's uh, who right was, right who was a daughter of charity of saint vincent de paul and for those of you that that know today is the feast day of saint vincent yes de that's paul, right with the poor. So I thought she deserved a little bit of credit as we were speaking. That's great. Yes, Can you she does. share with us a little bit about Father Ed's introduction to AA and also the very first meeting that he had, how he was introduced with Bill W is just fascinating to me. Please. Okay. Sure. Okay, sure. I'm going to speak fairly quickly because that's a lot to, uh, to pack in, but I, I love it uh, that you, that you asked uh, uh, about, about this uh, because, you know, these are some of my favorite uh, stories uh, about, uh, about father, uh, father Ed. Uh, so uh, with, re with, re with regard uh, to uh, the lay, the Leahy's, um, so I, I've been permitted by Edwin Leahy's uh, daughter uh, to uh, to breach his uh, anonymity. Normally in the book, I try to uh, I do my best to to respect uh, anonymity. Um, uh, but uh, the, the Leahy's had uh, adopted two orphans from uh, an orphanage run by uh, by the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, and so this nun uh, contacted Father Ed because she was distressed. She knew that Father Ed, as a former newspaper journalist, that he knew uh, Edwin uh, Leahy. Um, I'll just refer to him as Leahy to avoid confusion yes. with Father Ed. Uh, so she knew that that Father Ed knew Leahy, uh, who was a, a reporter, Washington reporter for the uh, Chicago uh, Daily News. Uh, and so I uh, she contacted Father Ed uh, to say that uh, the Leahy's, the couple had become estranged. The wife had taken uh, their two uh, young daughters uh, to live with family. And it was because of Leahy's drinking. Wow. Uh, Father Ed was, this was back in early 1940, he was known as a priest for people with problems. Mm. Uh, and so Father Ed kind of, you know, worked his magic, his gifts, and brought the Leahy's back together and extracted a promise from Edwin Leahy that he would no longer drink. But back then that was really all 
Father Ed could do to ask for a promise that Leahy wouldn't drink because at that point in January 1940, AA had yet to take off nationally. So Father Ed was unaware of, of AA. Um, and, you know, the big book had just come out the year before, but more than half of its 5,000 copies were just sitting in a warehouse because yeah. Bill Wilson was having trouble, you know, getting the word out. Uh, so a, a month after that reunion of the couple, Father Ed was passing through Chicago where the Leahys live and he dropped in on them and he was very happy to see that Edwin Leahy was no longer, uh, was still not drinking, but he was a little you know, concerned that Leahy said that he was spending time with his old drinking buddies, these reporters from the Chicago uh, daily, uh, daily uh, News in a group called Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, so L Leahy invited Father Ed to this meeting, and when Father Ed uh, experienced the meeting, he was it was a, a life changing experience uh, for him. It was like a kind of conversion experience, even though he was already a Catholic priest. He said afterwards that the graces that he felt from working with alcoholics were equivalent from the graces that he felt upon his ordination. That yeah. was how powerful it was uh, for him. Uh, it, it, it was the stories that real that really um, uh, that that really uh, you know trans transfixed uh, him. And then um, Father Ed took a copy of the big book. Uh, back with him to St. Louis, where he lived. And uh, a fellow Jesuit who was an alcoholic uh, pointed out to Father Ed that the 12 steps bore similarities to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, uh, which uh, Father Ed, like every uh, Jesuit, had had made these exercises, a 30-day retreat, uh, twice during his Jesuit uh, formation. And so the, the spiritual exercises had been really uh, responsible for Father Ed persevering in his Jesuit vocation. Um, and so uh, he, uh, Father Ed had himself like internalized the spirituality of those exercises. And when the connections between the exercises and the 12 steps were made evident to him, he had to meet Bill Wilson. And he imagined that Bill Wilson was like this great Ignatian master. He wanted to learn about how Bill had heard yeah. of the spiritual exercises and how Bill had incorporated these principles into his 12 steps. Uh, so in November of 1940, by which time Father Ed had started AA in St. Louis, um, uh, Father Ed uh, came to the AA clubhouse where Bill was living at that time and and not knowing that Bill at that time was on what Bill would later call a dry drunk. Uh, Bill mm. was terribly frustrated that AA hadn't taken off. Uh, he had thought that he was going to sober up all the drunks in the world. And so here's Father Ed, who by that point was badly crippled by arthritis. He was only five years, no, three years um, younger than than um, than Bill, um, I forget exactly how many years, but he was definitely younger than than Bill. Uh -huh. uh, he was born in eighteen. Father Ed was born in eighteen ninety eight, uh, but uh, to Bill, Father Ed at age forty two was the old man yeah. because he seemed so aged from his illness, which forced him to walk with a walk, walk with a cane, and so Father Ed, you know, hobbled up to to Bill's room at the clubhouse and said to him, uh, I'm very interested in the connections between your 12 steps and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. And Bill said, never heard of him. And Bill was not in a good mood. So he just kind of, <laughs> kind of, you know, you, you know, snapped, you know, never heard of him. And, and Father Ed laughed and that laugh broke the ice between them. And afterwards, Bill spoke of it as if speaking of conversion experiences, Bill spoke at the AA Comes of Age conference in 1955. He said that when he looked at Father Ed, it was like he saw this light emanating from Father Ed's face. Um, it was like uh, another conversion experience for Bill. And Bill found himself taking the fifth, making his fifth step uh, uh, with Father Ed, admitting his wrongs to God and to another person. Uh, and th that began a, a 20 year uh, friendship uh, during which Bill 
came to call uh, Father Ed, his spiritual sponsor. You know, sometimes people in AA say to me, well, wasn't Abby uh, Bill W.'s sponsor? And, you know, it's true uh, that um, Bill referred to Abby as his sponsor, but Bill also referred to certain special people as his spiritual sponsor because they may not have been official sponsors, but they helped him to better live the spirituality of the 12 steps. And Father Ed was the one whom Bill most often called his spiritual sponsor. Right. You know, it, it's interesting that the um, there's a part of the book that you describe where I believe it's Father Marco that had written all the, the, the similarities. That's right. The yes. And the Ignatian spiritual exercises on the wall and that everybody was kind of marveling at it. And as you pointed out, Bill had no idea of this commonality yes. and that he literally put the 12 steps together in 20 minutes and that Father Ed probably made no bones about the fact that he believed that the 12 steps were divinely inspired yes. you know, in, in many ways. He said, there's no way. If you told me it took 20 years to do it, it might have been like the research. <laughs> but the fact that he did it in 20 minutes meant that there was another force yes. you know, in the universe that was clearly at work to help him put all of that together. And I I, I read how beautifully you you wrote about that that first that initial meeting and it seemed like um there was a great synchronicity a great coalescing of energies between the two right at that moment yes, right yes there, there there really there really was and uh someone who helped me to understand this through his writings was um the great aa historian ernie kurtz oh, yes. uh he talks about that meeting in the movie uh the documentary movie bill w he also talks about it in his book not god um he says that it was the the meeting of a meeting of two people who had suffered uh yes. in different ways now until my research we really didn't know the extent to which Father Ed had suffered. It's sort of hinted at in the soul of sponsorship. It mentions the death of uh, Father Ed had a younger brother who died in the in the flu pandemic of 1918. Yeah. Father Ed also had his physical suffering. And I think there's even a, a mention in the soul of sponsorship of Father Ed describing that there was a point in his Jesuit novitiate in his first years as a Jesuit when he um, hit bottom. Uh, but I, I was able to find correspondence, including a, a letter that Father Ed wrote to his sister in which he goes into detail about this kind of dark night of the soul that he mm. experienced as a Jesuit novice. And I learned how Father Ed connected that to the experience of of hitting bottom, which is why the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius became so important for Father Ed, because they had those uh, principles of, of recognizing one's powerlessness and that, yes. and that one has to really um, do that kind of Kierkegaardian, Father Ed didn't use the, the word, the name Kierkegaard, but that kind of Kierkegaardian yeah. leap of faith, that leap yes into into the darkness and just trusting in father ed's case as he described it to his sister um his crisis was wondering whether he should make his first vows as a jesuit which novices will normally do at the end of their two-year uh, period of novitiate and um what father ed said to his sister that he came to realize was that every person's vocation whether they're a lay person or a religious or priest, every person's vocation uh, is to take up their cross mm -hmm. joyfully daily. And Father Ed came to see that the Jesuit vocation was a kind of a life cross, not just a daily cross, but a right. cross for life that God was inviting him uh, to take up. And when he realized that, he was able to take up uh, this uh, this cross and find a uh, joy uh, it, it, in it. Um, and that's why as a Jesuit, he took the vow name uh, Dismas after the good thief, because he felt that like the good thief, he had stolen paradise at the very last uh, minute, yeah. the 11th hour. Yeah, that is 
that is uh, so interesting. You know, I um, we have a, a wonderful conference coming up from the Center of Addiction and Faith on October 5th through 7th. I know Pastor Ed is going to talk to everybody about that a little bit, but uh, I'll be giving a talk there. And, and the talk that I'm giving is about the mutuality of brokenness. And, you yes. know, in our program, we say hurt people hurt people. And I say as well, yes, but healed people heal people. And you That's talk great. Me, I love that. Right? You taught me a word in this book that I hadn't heard. And when I when I researched my book, um, I learned a, a new word too, and that word was iatrogenic. And iatrogenic means that the hospital, not the hospital, I'm sorry, that the medical profession had actually caused um, the disease, uh, the, the, the opioid epidemic by mm -hmm. their overprescribing and whatnot, and 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 their their lack of attention, you know. It, and uh, misinformation. Um, so it was the industry that was now trying to save it that actually caused it, iatrogenic. And you taught me the word isopathy. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, that's correct. Yes. And you were saying that in the book that AA is an isopathic community. Can you explain to our audience what that word means? Because I think we're all going to use it from now on. It makes me feel very smart to say a new word. Oh, that's, and I, oh, that's I think wonderful. it's a great one. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, uh, that's actually a, a word I learned from Father Ed, and I think Father Ed got it from some reading of his. Um, it's a community of people with the same uh, condition helping one another. Uh, and so this was really a new phenomenon uh, in the time of AA. It was revolutionary. And uh, Father Ed believed that the AA 12 step model, as you said, in having made the 12 steps yourself, uh, Father Ed felt that this 12 step model could help people heal from any uh, problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he was really the first person to proclaim loudly and consistently in the media that the 12 steps were for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, it's so true, but that, that was so interesting to have people with an issue, but those people with the issue that was problematic now became the opportunity for the healing of that yes. very same problem. That really is a, that really is a wonderful, a wonderful word, a wonderful thought. And, you know, speaking of, of the suffering and, and Father Ed's commitment to those that were suffering, um, so much of his life was again around, around Alcoholics Anonymous. And as you said, the Cana Conference was the Cana Conference. Cause I don't know this was the Cana Conference, a precursor to what we know as like pre Cana now that we do in, in, in a certain in way. In a certain way, it was, although more kind of in name, in name on, only. Um, so uh, Father, Father Ed um, had heard about these family days, family conferences, and I think he actually gave them the name Cana Conferences. Uh, and so what these were were kinds of, kind of like what we would call days of recollection, uh, but they involved lectures for to married couples to to invite them to better communicate with one another and better see their relationship in light of in light of of God and the and the sacrament uh that and the holy spirit that 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 uh you know bound them together um but um towards the end of father ed's life he really believed that cana um didn't take off as it should have because he believed it should have been more like AA because mm -hmm. the Cana model was a model of a, of a priest giving talks and he felt towards the end of his life that it, it, that it, it should have made the leap to the couples ministering to to one to one another uh, but it was very important for its time because in the 1940s 19 1950s uh there really wasn't a lot of marriage ministry there isn't a whole lot today either but it was even even less uh back back then well i see Hi, everyone i'm i'm gonna interject here and uh we're gonna transition now from uh the conversation you two are having to uh, talk a little bit about uh the questions and answers we'd like to involve everyone in uh, uh asking questions uh of anything you've heard so far so think about what those questions are we'll get to those in just a second um but i have to do a commercial first i want to um I want to talk a little bit about the conference coming up next next week, a week from today, or a week from tomorrow, I should say. Uh, we have a, a conference coming up 
Um, it is at the center of addictionandfaith.com. Um, actually, addictionandfaithconference.com. Katie will put in a link to that conference coming up. If you can't be there in person, we have these uh, amazing lineup of powerful speakers, including Keaton. You can learn about the conference from the website, uh, but if you can't be there in person, you can attend virtually and hear the keynote speakers, speakers like Keaton Douglas, William C. Moyers, and others. Uh, the cost to attend is by free will offering if you're attending virtually. Um, and here's uh, a link to register for the virtual um, conference. I'll put that in the in the chat page if I can try and do two things at once here. There's the link to uh, register for the virtual conference. Um, addiction continues to uh, take the lives of our young people. It ravages our country with terrible consequences. We believe the church should and could be engaged, and we're working to make that happen, but it isn't easy. For some reason, this is a topic the church has managed to avoid. So we could use some help in this work. It's ongoing, and it's uh, it's continue. It's prophetic. Um, if you appreciate the work we're doing here to raise awareness and to reduce stigma and to engage faith communities around the issues of addiction, please consider making a one-time gift or a small monthly gift. We can't do this work um, without help. So we need your help. Uh, on the screen, I'll be putting up a, a Venmo um, a graphic, you, a QR code that you can use to, uh, to make a donation if I can make that work. Oops, I lost it. It's showing. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I see it. And you see the QR code? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I don't see that. What's wrong with it's me? It's on the screen for us. Okay. And then in the um, chat page, there's a link to PayPal if you prefer to do PayPal. Um, I'll put that link in the website or the chat page. This is too complex for me. <laughs> so, um, I think that's all I have to say. I uh, hope to see you at the conference uh, as a virtual attendee or in person. Um, Eaton, let's uh, let's go to the questions. Sure, this sounds great. Very good. So I'm certain that you've got uh, wonderful questions that are coming up. Let's see if uh, are we going to do that by individual's hands. Well, I would ask you to invite you to raise your hands or um, place it in the chat page. We don't have a Q and A button when we're doing a meeting like this, but raise a hand and we'll call on you and we'll unmute you and let you ask a question. I've got one from Jacob. Go ahead, Jacob. Hi, can you guys hear me? Okay, I always yes, sure you know, can. Technology is great when it works. Um, yeah. I am a member of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've been sober a while, but I'm also an archivist for uh, my district and the area. And so when I was reading, um, as I often do, the big book and other historical stuff and Kurtz and Chestnut, some of the other guys, um, there was a fellow whose name was uh, Bill used to call Jim the angry agnostic. And, uh, <laughs> and when Bill, you know, was going through this whole process about, you know, pick your own, pick your own um, idea of your higher power not calling it necessarily god you know bill was counseled by many people and um jim the agnostic apparently impressed upon him that if you just limit it to a belief in jesus and you know all that stuff that goes with it uh that you're going to turn people off that a drunk's not going to want to hear that he's just going to walk away and say well you know i'd rather drink so jim the agnostic uh in new york you know, had these discussions with Bill about people can pick their own um, definition of a, a power greater than themselves. And so, you know, Bill had lots of people. And, and the other thing I want to say is, um, I don't know if you come across this in your research, about a fellow who was called uh, Father John Doe. Have you ever come across that? Um, are you talking about the one who wrote the the, the Golden uh, yes. books? 
Yes, yes. Open books. Yes, and, yes, I am familiar with him. I, right. I, and he wrote a book under his own name as 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 well a a, a, a memoir. Uh, right. Yes, Ralph Ralph. Well, well Father Ralph. Ralph, Ralph. Thaw. Yeah, Ralph Thaw. And he, everybody poo pooed him, try to get rid of him, you know, send him to Indiana, send him here, you know, we don't want to talk to this guy. And eventually, um, you know, he lists himself as the first Catholic uh, priest who said, hey, I'm an alcoholic and we need to do something about this because it's serious. Well, um, because I'm involved in, in the audio part of archives, um, I have the records that were made by him, the Golden Books. And uh, uh, I won't go into a whole spiel because I, I could talk forever about the audio part of that. But um, a lot of that, you know, I'm glad that Bill was open enough mm -hmm. to get all these different views in order to form uh, the big book. So. Absolutely. absolutely. And if I might re re respond now, first of all, I'm sending you my e email Ad address. Can I just ask you before I respond, what district you're 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 in? I'm in uh, area 28, Maine, in District Three, which is Brewer, uh, Maine, where where Bill came in 1950 to do mm -hmm. a conference, which is yeah. you know really not well okay. known. And then I Excellent. was also well, also in, in Arkansas, the same thing. Excellent. Well, well, the closest I'm going to be speaking to to Maine is is Ver, is is Ver, Vermont. I'm just putting in my 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 blog uh, address here, where if you go to the talks page, you mm -hmm. can um, you can see where I'll be where I'll be speaking. Uh, but just in answer to to your what your point with regard to we agnostics, uh, okay. I just want to point uh ev everyone to if you go to uh to youtube you can you can find um uh father ed's talk in 1955 to the aa comes of age conference and he just has a wonderful you know part of his talk where he addresses agnostics uh this was something really special about about Father Ed, uh, that Father Ed um, truly modeled Christian witness in the sense of a Christian witness that even encompasses people who are not Christian, people who are atheists. Because from a true Christian perspective, we, all of us, were atheists at some point. No one of us was born with faith in Christ, even for those of us who uh, who are are Catholic and who, you know, and who believe the Catholic, you know, truth about uh, bap baptism, we still believe that the baby who's baptized is baptized because of the parents' faith, the community's faith. But for that baptism to flower, the person has to come to faith on his or her uh, own. Um, and so, and so, uh, Fa Father Ed was uh, truly a man ahead of his time in meeting people where they are. In 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 my book, I, I talk about how uh, he was he kind of he was a precursor of the the, the 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 Second Vatican Council. It was not until the Second Vatican Council that Catholic priests were even permitted to make a regular habit of ministering to non-Catholics. Before that, they were permitted to proselytize non-Catholics, <laughs> but they weren't permitted to simply meet non-Catholics and accompany them. And in all, the reason I call Father Ed a model is that he never denied his faith. He never said, well, if I can put aside my Catholicism for a moment, I can counsel you. No, he just did it from the heart of who he was, which was a, a, a priest with a heart full of love. Amen. Hmm. So thank you. And we've got a question from George Stevenson. George? Yes, good afternoon. I have more of a comment than a question, but... I uh, viewed Father Ed for the very first time at a rehab in the 80s. Uh, I was an inpatient at Valley Forge, a rehab center. And um, when Father Ed started talking. This is not, um, no, no, he died I, in 1960. Different, different person. Yeah, Father Ed. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, how did they, how did he come a, across his, uh, train of thought about alcoholism and, and addiction where did he get his information from and 
how much research did he have to really do to become so informed? Uh, that's a that's a great question. So uh, Father Ed uh, was um, unlike many of the Jesuits of his time. Uh, he didn't have a, a doctorate. He actually was not permitted to study towards a doctorate because he wanted to do a doctorate in psychology or failing that sociology or political science. And at that time, when he was uh, when he was doing his his studies, uh, Jesuits were. Um, yeah were quite, you know, limited and certainly psychology was not on the on the radar in terms of what or, or, or political science in terms of what they were they were permitted to uh, to uh, to study. Uh, and so um, he was sort of, you know, considered the lowest on the hierarchy of Jesuits because because he was simply ministering to ordinary people. Uh, but that was how he became so uh, beloved. And even though he hadn't been permitted to do higher studies, he was considered, he came to be considered to be a, a great sociologist uh, because he mm -hmm. did so much independent uh, research. He was like what we would call an autodidact, um, uh, just, just, you know, instructing himself in all these things. So he was very well read on the science of uh, of addiction, as much as there existed that in his time, because he first learned of AA during the uh, during the 19, 1940s. Uh, but actually, um, one of his former students uh, in high school, so he he taught high school in the twenties, and he stayed in touch with all his with all his students, uh, and uh, one of his uh, former students, as I talk about at the very end of Father Ed uh, was someone named uh, Vincent P. Dole. And after Father Ed's death, um, Vincent P. Dole had become a scientist uh, who, um, who after Father Ed's, Ed's death, um, was inspired by Father Ed's witness to develop uh, what we now, what we now know as, as, as uh, methadone. Um, and uh, Vincent Pito was uh, then invited by Bill Wilson to be one of the non-alcoholic members of uh, AA's board. Uh, and Dole always uh, credited Father Ed with inspiring him to go into that uh, that uh, area of, of research. So Father Ed did have an effect kind of by his inspiration on the scientific side uh, of uh, addiction research. Hmm. Very well. I, I, it came to mind who I was thinking about. It was Father Martin. That's who. Uh, yes. 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 But how interesting and how how well received the program of alcoholism is and is spiritually based. Um, yes. You know you that know, this wall for Christ is uh, outstanding. Hi, Keaton. It's outstanding, and hey, uh, you know I'm a favorite. Amen. <laughs> of the program. Amen. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. Fred Pratt has a question. Fred. Hi, uh, my name is Fred. I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, John, we hear a story in AA that at one point in time, Bill had considered converting to Catholicism. But at the end, he decided not to do it because he thought it might be negative to AA. Uh, right. Can you comment if that story is correct and if Father Ed had any influence on yeah. Bill's decision either to convert or not to convert to Catholicism? That's, that's absolutely you. that's absolutely right. Uh, you, 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 just, you described it, you encapsulated it very well. Uh, so in Father Ed, I, I kind of, Take a microscope to all those different interactions yes. between uh, between Father Ed and Bill Wilson with regard to the Catholic faith. Uh, one thing I found was that Father Ed never ever applied any pressure to Bill about the Catholic faith. Um, behind the scenes, he was writing to to you know Sister Ignatia, the angel of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, and saying, "Pray for Bill. He's so close." <laughs> but you know, in terms of his actual communications with Bill, I uh, he tried very hard to be as as delicate as he could because I think he recognized. Well, first of all, he recognized that. 
faith is a decision that can be made only in total freedom. But I think also he was concerned for his friendship with with Bill, and he didn't want it to turn into a proselytizing uh, relationship. Um, but yes, uh, ultimately, Bill did believe that as a symbol of AA, that it would harm AA if if Bill became Catholic, because he felt that it would imprint in people's minds the idea that AA existed simply to turn people into Catholics. Yeah, you go through that beautifully in the book. That's a beautiful explanation about the various, mm -hmm. just as, as Fred was so apt to point out, the various influences in his life, Fulton Sheen, but yes. also uh, Francis, the uh, the psych psychologist, was it? Yes, that's right. Right. Yeah, that's also... right. So Bill was seeing a Jungian psychologist, and uh, and the uh, psychologist was was uh, really um, encouraging Bill more in his sort of spook sessions. You know, the the sessions where uh, Bill would. Um, would believe that you know the spirits were entering him. I mean, I, I, I'm oversimplifying a bit because the psychologist didn't. I, I don't know if the psychologist specifically to, spoke to him about the spook sessions, but when I read into what the psychologist had 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 written uh, her articles, uh, what I found uh, was that she was quite anti-Catholic and had a much more New Age perspective, and so Bill was you know, seeing this psychologist one day a week and seeing Fulton Sheen for Catholic instruction another day <laughs> of the week. And, and you know, the two wow. world views were so- You're Not kidding. Um, that, that, you know, that they, it couldn't be a case of them both winning. And, and it's yeah. that the Jungian perspective is the one that, that won the day for him. You know, you wrote something, and I, I, I just want to share this with everybody. It's a, it's a little paragraph that you wrote. If any of you have the book in front of you and you want to follow with me, it's on page two twenty two, um, and it just, it was for me a summary of everything that was perfect. Just one th little paragraph, and you wrote, "It was Father Ed's gift to see heaven through the lives of people who were striving to overcome great suffering one step at a time." and to help them see for themselves the divine grace he saw at work amidst their struggles. And that to me, that to me is, is, was everything this father Ed hmm. in a nutshell. Um, Thank you. Yes. I, I, I'm so glad that, that you like that passage. That passage was my way of reflecting on uh, father Ed when he was listening to an AA member uh, named uh, Chuck C., uh, when he was listening to him talk about uh, his own um, his his own struggles and and triumphs, uh, Father Ed reflected and said, "Sometimes I think heaven is just a new pair of glasses." Wow. Hmm. Huh. Uh, Father Ed received again just his greatest personal graces from working with people in in AA. Um, nothing made him happier uh than than that but then then witnessing their uh triumphs through their struggles yes mm. yes so awesome. I, I i i referenced this earlier and that was um uh it's always exciting for those of us who are in recovery like myself when people who are not in recovery recognize the value of it um and so to learn that father ed understood that and valued it and called uh, called himself underprivileged um, is is very cool. I mean, I always say I'm grateful that I get to be an alcoholic because I get to be a part of this fellowship. Amen. So I'm always curious to how people like yourself um, come to be interested in the topic and, and see uh, the value of it and the worth of it. How did you come by your interest? Uh, thank you. Well, well, you know, as a non-alcoholic, I, I would say, I, although I don't pretend to have had an experience of th that's you know just like the experience of addiction um i've certainly hit bottom um probably a few times in my life in terms of just uh depression ptsd i mm -hmm. suffered sexual abuse as as a child also suffered uh verbal abuse emotional abuse mm -hmm. um in the course of my life i've suffered uh, a number of uh, assaults i've um i've also um I, I, I'm also a 9-11 sur survivor. I was uh, volunteering on a food boat docked at Ground Zero 
uh, 10 days after 9-11 uh, during the recovery uh, effort. Uh, and um, and perhaps as a result of, of that, I developed uh, thyroid cancer and was successfully treated uh, for that. Um, and, you know, I, I live with the effects of PTSD. So I know that in my own healing journey, I've had to admit powerlessness. I've had oh. to uh, admit my my need for divine grace, and I've also had to cooperate with 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 grace and to be an agent in my own healing. Mm. Um, admitting powerlessness also involves admitting what my wounds are and how they happened. It doesn't have to be necessarily what's known as exposure therapy with, you know, affectively reliving each yeah, right. experience, but it has to at least be an acknowledgement that such and such happened at such and such a date, as far as I can remember, and and that it affected me. Um, so uh, that has given me some points of uh, of empathy with with uh, the experience of of addicts and and I just I know the difference between having someone who understands and feeling like no one understands mm -hmm. and so uh, I was you know very drawn to Father Ed as a as a person of understanding I mean you look at this face and you just imagine I imagine how Father Ed was in his office at the Queen's work, which was a, a Jesuit uh, pu publishing ministry in St. Louis. And uh, people would line up outside his office every day from every walk of life to to see that face and to pour out their their problems to that face. And and people uh, would say several people said that if you don't have a problem, Father Ed will find you slightly boring. <laughs> and they, you know, Father Ed was the only priest they ever knew who they felt more comfortable seeing with a problem mm. than without a problem. <laughs> um, um, and I mean, how many people in our lives can we say that of? I mean, even if we're blessed to have a good support network, there is still, it's hard to find that person whom we can come to with anything mm. and know that we'll feel better speaking Amen. with a that. person in whom one's soul can rest Aylred of Rivo, absolutely a beautiful. spiritual yeah. friend amen yes mm. beautiful well you uh, for somebody not in recovery you articulate your own brokenness so easily and so comfortably it tells me um you know that's i think the gift that recovery people have to give to the church is that genuine, authentic brokenness that allows for us all to open up and say, yeah, that's right. I, I'm hurting too, because I think underneath every human soul, there's hurt. Amen. Yes. Yes, that's right. And which is why I'm so grateful for what you do and, and for, uh, and for what everyone, you know, participating in this does in terms of being present for people who need someone to be present uh, for them. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's amazing when I think about, you know, what the combined energies and and you know good goodwill of the people participating in this what you do and all the di different ways in which you you all shed light in the in the world i'm i'm really grateful to, to be to be speaking with you well we're so grateful to have you here today yeah. you're a, you're a font of knowledge it's really amazing how much you can uh, how much you know and can articulate it really is impressive thank you um, so thanks for being here, and and thank you, Keaton, for your hosting today. Um, you, you are also an impressive person. You 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 obviously prepared and read the book and knew what you were talking about. So I love thank it. you for great stuff. Really good stuff. Um, this webinar will be. Uh, don't forget to register for the conference. If you can't be there in person, you can come virtually with a free will offering. Uh, here's some other great speakers. Uh, today's webinar is recorded, will be available on our smartphone app, which is free. Just look on your app store under Center of Addiction and Faith. It's filled with resources. Um, uh, it's loaded with information, links, tools for addiction ministry. Uh, best of all, it's free. Um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for the work that you do in the world. And I uh, hope to see you at the conference and next month for our next webinar. And Dawn, I'll God see you in a couple you. of weeks in Rockaway.
Wonderful. Look forward to it. Thank, Thank you, you all. And God bless you. God bless everyone. Thank you. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. See y'all later.